My presentation tonight will be about finding messianic meaning as the Nephites found it in the Book of Mormon in their keeping the law of Moses. Uh, don't worry about reading any text. Uh, I will tell you what it is, so you can just look at pictures when there are pictures, but don't worry about the words. I will, I will tell you. So, pray for me, I can tell you. <laughs> the words slowly. Okay. It is my prayer and hope that you all can find messianic meaning in this book as well as we understand the Nephites, the people of this book, as they found Christ in their rituals. He is the author of the rituals, the Mosaic Law, and they use that in ways that I will show you. But first, I would like to start off with a quote by President Benson. He said this about the Book of Mormon, and I would like you to really let this sink deep into your hearts and minds. It is very true. It has been very true in my life. I can testify that what President Benson says about, about this book is very, very true. It is not just that the Book of Mormon teaches us truth though it indeed does that. It is not just that the Book of Mormon bears testimony of Christ, though it does that too. But there is something more. There is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your life, your lives, the moment you begin a serious study of the book. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. The scriptures are called the words of life. And nowhere is that more true than it is in the Book of Mormon. When you begin to hunger and thirst after those words, you will find life in greater and greater abundance. So if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, or perhaps don't understand it all, that's okay. That is what's important about tonight. First, in order to understand how the Nephites found Messianic meaning in their daily lives, it's important to understand that they lived their life according to the law of Moses, because they were Jews. And Jews lived that law strictly. How do we know that the Nephites were Jews? <coughs> Lehi was of the tribe of Manasseh, but he and his family lived in the lower kingdom of Judah. Because of that, they were Jews. Anyone that lived in the lower kingdom of Judah were considered Jews. So, that is how we know that Lehi and his family were Jews. Therefore, as practicing Jews, they would have observed to keep the statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things, according to the law of Moses. You'll find that in 2 Nephi 5.10. So we summarize it by saying, by suggesting the Nephites were true to their word and were strict to observe the law of Moses, and its statutes, ordinances, judgments, and commandments. I mean to imply that the Nephites were no more or less <coughs> Jewish than Jesus himself. Okay. Therefore, Lehi and his family were Jews who kept the law of Moses, as were their posterity, who, and who lived in the Promised Land led to the promised land by God. 
So tonight, we're going to talk about the seven holy feasts that are in the Law of Moses. Okay? So first, let's talk about the Law itself. Where do we find it in the Book of Mormon, and where do, where do we see that it's practiced? There's 37 scriptures in the book stating they kept the law of Moses strictly. There's 20 scriptures showing how they kept the law of Moses in their daily lives, in their culture. It was a way of life for them. So we'll talk about some of those tonight. What did it mean to them in their own words? What do we know about their law in this book? Also, what did it look like? Do we see it being practiced in real life, in daily life? And yes, we will find that. But where did they get it? Where did the Nephites get the law? Well, the law is on what's called the Torah, or Torah. The Torah contains the five books of Moses, and they are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Jews call it Torah. But did the Nephites have this? Yes. All five of those books are contained on the brass plates, along with other valuable teachings. The brass plates were taken by Nephi and his family from Jerusalem when they left. They were brought to the Promised Land. They were passed down through their family, through generations. And they are preserved and kept very, very careful because they contain the law that we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so what did it mean to them in the words of Jacob, the prophet Jacob, Nephi's younger brother? What did he tell us about this law? What it was to them? He said, And we also worship the Father in his name. And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to him. And for this cause, it is sanctified unto us for righteousness. He then goes on to say, We knew of Christ, and we had a hope of his glory many hundred years before his coming. The law gave them hope. Hope in Jesus Christ who they knew would come. Even if it was many hundred years, they knew it and believed it. And that was the law for them. How do we know that they knew it was going to be many hundred years before he came? Well, Nephi told his people three different verses in the Book of Mormon that his coming would be 600 years from when his father left Jerusalem. Three different times he told his people, people, he will come in 600 years. <coughs> now, here's one, one of the scriptures, 1 Nephi. And he cometh, according to the words of an angel, in 600 years from the time my father left Jerusalem. You will find that... In 1 Nephi 19.8. That seems like a long way off. Ah, oh, that's a long time. Right? Would it be difficult to know that he wouldn't be coming for 600 years? Would it be difficult to stay rooted to your, your religion, your truth, your, your standards, to think 600 years before he comes? But they did. That was the power of the law that we're going to talk about. But perhaps we can put the shoe on the other foot and look at it from their eyes. From our eyes, we have a great advantage that we can look back and know that it happened. We can have a surety that Jesus went into Gethsemane. He died on the cross. We know that. It happened 2,000 years ago. We have records. But these people didn't have that. They had to hope that it was going to happen hope that he would come and die for them and provide salvation for them. So it's, it's different. 
So that's where the law comes in. It keeps them tethered, connected to their bridegroom. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. You are his bride. We are his bride. And they, this law kept them connected to their bridegroom. It was alive for them. And they did this through daily rituals, monthly rituals, and of course the seven holy feasts that we will talk about tonight. When Lehi left with his family and brought the records, the records still had Jesus Christ in them. Sadly, in, in Israel, the Israel they left behind, the Jews there took Jesus out of the law. It became a dead law. It became a checklist for them. But Lehi, with the brass plates, had Jesus in the law, and it was alive for them. And so therefore it infused the law with joy that brought the commandments to life for them. Okay, so with that understanding, let's look at the seven holy feasts. But before we do, we need to sh I tell you that a scholar saying, as Jews keeping the law of Moses, that means they also kept all of the seven holy feasts. So what he's saying here is the Nephites kept and observed and practiced these heavy seven holy feasts as Nephites. So that, that's what that's saying. Okay. We're going to start off with the shofar. Shofar, right? You know? Okay. Usually it's big. Mine's small, so it fits in my suitcase. <laughs> so what does this have to do with the holy days, right? I'm going to try to go They blow loud, right? What 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 does the shofar have to do with our holy days? Okay. Well, it introduces the weekly Sabbath. The priest blows to announce the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, the new moon, the monthly new moon, and before all the holy feasts, he blows this from the mountaintop all to the the the, the, the people. The feasts are here. This is the shofar. But remember, it also was thundered from the top of Mount Sinai by God himself when he called the people in the wilderness of Sinai up onto the mountain. God used a shofar. It also was used to break down the walls of Jericho, right? And then it also confused and defeated the enemies of Gideon. So it has great history with God. Okay? Symbolically, it's rounded to represent a bowed head. So humility and a bent heart, repentance. So visually, it's to remind us of repentance and humility. And that through true repentance, we will be redeemed by the horns of a ram just like Isaac. Isaac, Mount Moriah, remember Abraham? Right before Isaac, right before uh, he was going to have to plunge the knife into Isaac, a ram was in the thicket, it was caught in the thicket by the horns, saved Isaac. Okay? So, shofar. slide is not right. <laughs> I'll tell you. Seven holy days. Um, no, that's like, I'm sorry. The one in the spring is Passover. We'll talk about Passover. And then those are in the fall. That we have something on the slide. Okay. Where do these uh, festivals come from? Leviticus. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, Jehovah, Jesus, told the people, These are the feasts of the Lord, of me, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. 
The word convocation means to rehearse, to practice, rehearse, rehearse the events of my life, of my mission, of my death. Seven feasts teach the people those three things. His life, his mission, his death. And there are seven. Okay? Remember, Leviticus was in the brass plates. That's how the Nephites knew about this. So Pesach, Passover. They use the Hebrew word Pesach. means to, to pass over. Okay? Leviticus 23 tells the people what to do on Passover. We're going to talk about that. It's the night when the destroying angel came through Egypt. Remember? And he killed all the firstborn of Egypt. All the firstborn sons, the firstborn cattle, the firstborn of everything <coughs> was taken by this destroying angel. To prevent that from coming into your home, to the homes, the Lord told Moses, Moses, to not have death come into your home, you must do four things tonight. And then we will, I will lead you tomorrow. I will take you out. These people were slaves. They've been living for four generations in horrible conditions, in slavery. All day long working, building for Pharaoh, building his buildings, building, 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 no rest. Very little food, squalid conditions. So, he told Moses, every family must take their lamb, a lamb, and today, this afternoon, before angel of destruction is coming, slit the throat of the lamb. <coughs> Collect the, bla the blood in a bucket. Take a hyssop branch. This is all of it. Take a hyssop branch. Go to your door. This is your door of your house. You have a post. And a post in your door, and a post. And you are to dip the branch in the bucket of blood, strike the doorpost. We're there, and up here. Not, not rub, not paint. Strike. And blood is spurting everywhere. Why? Why, why, why strike? Does anybody know why? Imagination. Scourging. It's to people to see that when Jesus would come, they would scourge him. <coughs> so this is like scourging. Remember, everything about these rituals and these details are to point to him. So when he comes and dies for them, they would recognize these, these things. So, get to do that. Then... <coughs> they are to take their lamb and open up the chest cavity open put a stick across a stick in the ground and roast it upright on a stick <laughs> okay let's go back well, okay. Roast upright on a stick. Take the entrails, the intestines, the entrails out. Wrap them around the head. It's like a crown. So you have a lamb, one-year-old lamb, male, all white. No blemishes. And roasted on a stick. It looks like a cross with the crown. Who does that look like? Jesus. Jesus. Then they are to, when it's roasted, take it into their house, close the door, lock it, not come out again through the night. Never, no, what, no matter what, don't come out. They are to eat their lamb with their family with bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. Why? Why bitter herbs? The bitterness on the cross. Death, the, bitter, the bitterness of death. They eat all the lamb. They're to consume all of it. Not waste any of this lamb. All of it. 
We can't waste any of Jesus' sacrifice. We must all of Jesus heals for us. We eat all the lamb. Then they are to make their bread. They always made bread every day. Bread is where Egypt is where bread was started. But they were to not put leaven in their bread. Okay? You've seen the matzah? Matzah? Right? It's not leavened, it's flat. And to make it so their bread will not rise, they do three things so that otherwise the bread will rise. And Moses said, Jesus said, no rising, no, no leaven. So they take their bread, they lay it flat, and they pierce it. They pierce it with a sharp instrument, they pierce it. And then they stripe it with a knife, and they cut, they put the, they cut small cuts in it. And then they cook it, and on cooking it, it takes on a bruised, Look, you see the, the, the bruised look from cooking? So it's pierced, it's striped, and it's bruised. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Right? We'll talk about that. Then they were to go to bed and leave in the morning forever. But the angel of death didn't just kill those, it killed those who didn't have the blood, on their doors, but for those who did apply the blood of the Lamb, the angel of light and healing came into their homes and healed all within their homes. So if you had a broken leg or you were blind, you would be healed. So the next morning when you left with Moses, no, no sickness, no infirmity. You were whole. You were made whole by the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> you were healed by the blood of the Lamb. You were saved by the blood of the Lamb. The door is our hearts. We put the blood of the Lamb on our hearts, and it saves us. And He is the door, and we He comes through our door of our hearts with through His blood that is here. So Passover. If you uh, were to put a cross right here, and someone is on the cross, you could hear here there would be blood, right? You had a crown of thorns, there would be blood. So, crown of thorns, blood, blood, here, and here. He wants them to look for him and to know that he's coming to give his life for them, to save them. So, he's giving them all of these details, very rich details. They cannot miss him. There's another door. He is, he is the door to our souls. Okay? The Book of Mormon, um, oh, let me go back to this, huh? pierced, striped, bruised, Isaiah prophesies of Jesus Christ, I believe Isaiah 53, he says, he will be bruised for our iniquities, by his stripes we are healed, he will be pierced for us. So, in the Book of Mormon, we learn of Lamb of God over and over again. 62 times the word Lamb in the book. And of those 62 ta times, I'm sorry, 62 times Lamb of God is in the Book of Mormon. The Nephites. 37, the Lamb of God. 8, the Church of the Lamb. 13 times Apostle of the Lamb or Gospel of the Lamb. He wants us to know that he is the lamb. Okay? So, and when you consider the qualities of a lamb, lamb is white, unspotted, meek, loyal, trusting, pure, innocent. All of those things are he, him, the lamb of God. Next festival, number two, is called Feast of Unleavened Bread. Talk to you about this where starting that day that they left for seven days, no leaven in your bread at all. None. You could only eat unleavened bread. We talked about how they made it. Okay? Like I said, it's uh, bruised, striped, and pierced. I will read Isaiah 53. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus is the bread of life, too. The bread of life. The next feast, number three, feast of first fruits. Okay? This one is found in Leviticus 23. Here's what we learn. Israel was to bring the first ripe sheep of barley to the priest who would wave it to the Lord in a prayer offering on behalf of the people, dedicating the harvest to him. <coughs> this is, in a nutshell, families, along with the temple priests, would plant barley in their fields 70 days before Passover. Three days, think of three days, after Passover begins, they are to cut it down, bundle it in sheaves, bring it to the priest, wave offering, the first fruits of the season. Something to think about at Jesus' death. Just as the sun set at Passover, for we know he was actually killed on Passover. He was the sacrificial lamb that day on Passover on the cross and just as the sun set a group of men were cutting down the barley as the first fruits of the season in the in the fields and in that week this cutting down of barley would have happened on pa Passover on Christ's death and then it would sit in the temple for three days because three days after Passover is when the, the priest goes to the temple and lifts this up Barley would have been lifted up on the third day, just like Jesus, the first of the harvest. That very same morning, he was the first fruit of the harvest of the dead. In fact, Lehi, in the book, talks about Jesus and he said, Wherefore, he, Jesus, is the first fruits unto God. Jacob, his son, also said, ye may obtain a resurrection and be presented as the first fruits of Christ unto God. They, this was uh, showing us a connection to this feast that they, that they observed, that they loved. It pointed their souls to him. Fourth, fourth of seven is Shavuot. Shavuot means feast of weeks. This happens the first part of June, and they celebrate that this is when the law of Moses was given. They believe that 50 days after the people left Egypt, that Moses was called up onto the mount and given the law. And he was also at that time betrothing he, as the bridegroom, was betrothing with the people, uh, making a covenant to marry the people. Because in Jewish tradition, a betrothal happens between a man and a, a bride and a bridegroom. The co bridegroom comes to the bride's house and they write a contract. And they say, we are betrothed, but they are not married yet. But it's a binding contract. And then the groom goes back to his home and he doesn't see his bride for the year, for one year at least. And he goes to his home and he builds onto his father's home a place for his bride to come. And then sometime when the father says, yes, you can go get your bride, the groom leaves in the night. And he goes to the bride's home and he says, I'm here, I'm here to take you as my bride now. And he takes his bride back to the home he built onto his father's. So, we'll talk more about brides and bridegrooms, but this is what Israel believes is happening. That Jehovah is betrothing them to him with the Ten Commandments and the law. Just like in a marriage ceremony. 
This is Shavuot. This is when he got these. And this is when they use leavened bread. Remember, Feast of Unleavened Bread, no leaven. But now they are to take the wheat, the summer wheat harvest, and make a loaf of wheat bread that has leaven in it. There is leaven in this bread, and they are to present it to the priest who waves it as a wave offering. Why is there leaven in this bread now? Because Jesus is the pure leaven. The old leaven puffed up pride, philosophies of men, worldly, secular, puffed up, old leaven, bad. After Jesus is lifted up, he is the pure leaven. Now he has the power to lift us up unto resurrection. We don't have the power to lift up without Jesus. He is the new leaven. He lifts us up unto eternal life. Now they use leaven in their bread for this holy day. Now, next, we go to Feast of Trumpets. That is in September, October. Rosh Hashanah. So also, okay. The Lord is, calls in Leviticus, blowing of trumpets, the rehearsal of the blowing of trumpets. It is to commence the season of Teshuvah. Teshuvah. What does Teshuvah mean? To repent, to turn, literally to turn. Repentance in the Jewish law, the Jewish idea, is simply to turn, turn back to Him. Wherever you are in your life, wherever you are on your path, it doesn't matter. All you do, you turn back to Him and you face God wherever you are. That is Teshuvah, repentance. This calls people. The final harvest is here. Turn to God and look and live. So they blow the horn. Because in 10 days, in 10 days from now, Feast of Trumpets, long 10 days later is Yom Kippur. But on this day, on Feast of Trumpets, the Book of Life is opened. If you have lived a good life and you are good with God and good with neighbors, your name is found in the book of life. If it's not, if you're not right with your family, your friends, your neighbors, you have 10 days to get right with God, get right with your family, get right with your neighbors, apologize, ask forgiveness. Because Yom Kippur is in 10 days, and that is when the book is sealed for another year. If your name is not in this book, you won't make another year. So, 10 days is spent getting right, repenting. Before we talk a little bit more about that, I actually want to talk about this. This is part of the law. It looks like, well, it's a prayer shawl. Yeah, prayer shawl. So, in the book, uh, the Torah, Leviticus, men, boys are commanded to wear this. And Nephites, Nephi and his family would have worn something similar to this. It is commanded that it has fringe on each of the corners. Not this, this is decorative. Fringe, fringe. Fringe, fringe, four corners. And they wear it under their clothing. So in Israel, you'll see men everywhere wearing this. Clothing over the top. So this comes out the bottom of their clothing. What are the fringes for? It's explained in the book, Leviticus, to avert their eyes, to give men, boys, something to look down to, if they come across something that would compromise them, they look upon a woman with lust, or they come upon a situation that is not good for them, they avert their eyes <coughs> to their fringe. Another thing. Jesus wore this. The woman 
in the New Testament with the issue of blood. She believed and knew if she could touch Jesus, Jesus' shawl, that she would be healed. In the King James, it says she touched his hem, but a better translation is she touched his fringe. She touched his fringe. And that was enough. Her faith in Jesus Christ and who he was healed her instantly. And he felt it go out of him. And he looked and said, who, who touched me? I felt the healing go out of me into you. And she was nervous because she had an issue of blood. And when that situation, Jews, you can't be around blood. She was nervous, but she had so much faith that she went and reached anyway, and he healed her. He was so happy to have healed her. He heals all of us. So, when it says Jesus has healing in his wings, he has healing in his wings. Okay? Also, the word for this is talit. Talit. It means little tent. Because the Jews are commanded to pray always, just like us. Pray always, anywhere you are. Don't wait until you go home. You have an instant tent. You have a little tent. So you can pray anytime, anywhere in your tent. In the marketplace, while you're walking, among your field, you can pray in your little tent. So in a wedding, a bride will often give this to her bridegroom as a gift. She will make this a pretty with wool. This one's a wool. And she presents it to him at their ceremony. And I, I have a picture I'll show you later. We'll talk about it. But it's a gift that a bride gives to her bridegroom. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, remember, Feast of Trumpets. One more year in the Book of Life. That is what you want. Moroni on the temples. Right? He's sounding the call to repentance. The final harvest of souls is here. The bridegroom is coming. On our temples, reminding us, come, come, repent. He's coming. He's coming. In fact, Moroni came to Joseph Smith on the Feast of Trumpets in 1827, September 22nd, when he received the golden plates. And for seven years after that, Moroni came on the Feast of Trumpets. So I'm sorry, before that, starting in 23 for the seven years after that. Feast of Trumpets. Okay. Yom Kippur. Day of Atonement. This is the big day, the solemn day, the day of atonement. It is made for all of Israel, all on this one day. It comes from the word kapar in Hebrew, which means to cover. This day covers you for one more year. This is what the high priest does in behalf of all of Israel after they have repented. He approaches the veil, the Holy of Holies, in the temple. The Holy of Holies has a veil, very tall, and he, one day, or one day a year, he goes to the veil, he parts the veil, and he goes in. He's the only man permitted to do this, and it's only on this day. And what does he do? He takes blood, he sacrificed animals on behalf of the people outside and for all of Israel. And he gathers the blood in a bucket, big buckets, gallons of blood. He takes it into the Holy of Holies. This is the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. This is the ark. And he throws the blood, scatters the blood all over. All over the, the, the altar and the mercy seat to atone for the blood of Israel. And it's very messy. This doesn't depict it, but he ends up, because of all the blood, he comes in with white clothing. He comes out drenched in blood on his feet, on his hands, all over his body. 
or his white linens. So when he comes back out to the people that are waiting outside the temple, he says, it is done. It is done. He perhaps looks more like this in red. Reminiscent of another high priest, his white linen garment would be drenched in blood for the reason, same reason. Only in this garden, on this night, it wouldn't be symbolic, it would be literal. His blood. He's the great high priest who wasn't using the blood of an animal. It was his blood that would atone for us, that would cleanse us. So, that is why uh, imagery explains the reason when Jesus comes again, the second coming, he doesn't come in white. We learn in Doctrine and Covenants 133, The Lord shall be red in his apparel, for their blood I have sprinkled on my garments and stained all my raiment. raiment. He will come in blood, I mean in red, one more thing. The high priest goes in barefoot. And when he emerges, his feet are covered in blood, looking like one who has trod the winepress. He said, Jesus, I have trod the winepress alone. Meaning, he has done this for us. <coughs> Let's talk about uh, last feast. Seventh. Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot. 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 Taber uh, means uh, tabernacle or booth. Okay? It lasts eight days and it is joyous. Joyous. It is uh, uh, happy. All the other uh, feasts are solemn, stoic. This one is happy, rejoice, feast, festival, eight days. Commanded to be joyful. The sacrifice is done. Now it is time to rejoice in his life now, in life. So, they take uh, branches of palm trees and thick willows of the brook and they rejoice and they wave them and they do very rejoiceful, fun, festival things. Because they're celebrating, their sins are forgiven. This is harvest now. It's time to enjoy. So, this harkens back to the Exodus, when the people in Mount Sinai, they lived, or in, in the Sinai Desert, they lived these temporary booths, why they lived there, in the desert, for 40 years. So, this was, the Lord protected them, and kept them safe in these dwellings. So they recreate these dwellings at their homes. Okay? And those dwellings were called sukkah. And they also make them the same thing for their marriage, the hupa. Sukkah and hupa. Same idea. That they represent his pavilion, his covering. That they are invited to dwell in. In a hupa. Is to dwell in with your bride, with him as the groom, and you are the bride. So symbolic of the wedding canopy. Also, in this festival, they use twenty foot menorahs, menorahs, light stands, twenty foot, and they light them up, and it's light, 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 the light of the world. It's here now. It's the ultimate wedding celebration for them. The bridegroom has come. So now, they build this in their backyards. They sleep in them for seven days, outside, even now. Outside, and oh, the top is not entirely covered, only part of the, the roof is covered. Part is open so they can see the stars and the heavens and they can see him. So they sleep in these. These go in, even on Brooklyn, New York, back porch. See that? So they sleep out there. Modern day in Brooklyn. It is because they this law and these 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 festivals 
keep them immersed in their hope of their bridegroom. So I want to talk to more about this at the bride at the wedding. So when a bride and bridegroom stand under the sukkah, the bridegroom takes this and he places this over his bride together. So they are both under this. And he is saying, in that, he says, I am now your protection. I will cover you financially, emotionally, sexually. I am your covering. I am your bridegroom. That's what they are reenacting here with this, under the sukkah, which is like, or under the hupa. Okay. So those are the seven holy days that the Jews and by therefore or the Nephite Jews would have practiced. And why? Like I said, because it brought him into their lives all these details, rich details, <coughs> daily lives, because they weekly kept the Sabbath day very strictly. In Jerem we learn. We kept the Sabbath day very strictly. Mosiah, we learned. We kept the Sabbath day very strictly. And we passed these things. In America, God provided all, all the things needed. When Lehi and Nephi got there, these things were there for them already. He provided them so when he brought them to a promised land and commanded they keep this law, he provided ways for them to do it so that they could stay close to him and connected to him. He brought them to a, a land where they could remember him, his life, and his mission. And he did it with stunning detail, as you can see, through these rehearsals and these rituals. Another interesting and important thing to know about this book, it is the only book in the world that is both a Jewish text and a Christian text at once, simultaneously. Nowhere will you ever find a book that contains the law and the Jewish rituals and all things law of Moses with the Christian, the Christian uh, views and understanding of Jesus. Because the Nephites never had to separate them. The law was Jesus for them. And that is how they stayed connected to him that way. It is astonishing. No other book can say that, right? And that is one of the reasons that it is such a powerful, transformational book that, uh, that, that President Benson talks about. So I want to talk in closing now. We're done. Oh, let's see. Sorry. In closing, I want to say... That Jesus, okay. Jesus wants a relationship. He has a love for each and every one of you. He wants to have a connection with you through your daily rituals. We don't keep the law of Moses anymore. But that doesn't mean that you can't create these rituals and this language with him in your lives, in your heart. How can you do this? How can you establish a connection with him so personal, so unique, so beautiful? It doesn't have to be necessarily this. It's your language with him. So, when you eat your bread in the morning or your toast, hold your bread and say, Ah, oh, he is the pure leaven. He lifts me up. This bread is light and fluffy because of him. He does that for me. When you wash your face at night in the water, you know that it's through him. He's the water of life. He is living water. And he cleanses us daily. When you eat your food, how about when you, when you put clothing on? No, you won't wear this, but you put your clothing on and you say, Ah, Jesus covers me. He keeps me warm. He protects me. He is my covering. Jesus is my covering. What is it that you can find in your life that will connect you to him in a way that these things connected them to Jesus for 600 years until he came. There are so many ways because Jesus is in everything. All things are, as Moses said, all things typify Christ. All things. The chair you sit on is rest for your soul. Right? Everything you can see him in. Find things that connect you to him. And then as you read the book, the book, and you open it up, 
That power comes into your life and answers your questions. Even if they're not about the scriptures per se. You want to know about your life, your mission, a relationship, a friendship. Take that question in your heart. Take it to the book. And the Holy Ghost customizes the message and the words to answer your questions. That is what President Benson is talking about. The, the power transcends the words. Okay, that is our promise right here. And bear you my testimony. That is in my life. I have daily rituals. I have weekly rituals. I have monthly rituals, I do. Between me and him, that are connecting me to him. He's my bridegroom. And I love him. I love him. And he has protected me. And he has covered me. When they take the lamb, they make sure when it's open, they cannot break any bones. That is a rule. No bones broken when they roast their lamb upright. Do you know why? Because for him to be able to take on our pains and our brokenness, he must remain unbroken. It's the only way it works. The one unbroken for all the brokenness. One must remain unbroken. He was he who remained unbroken. So, on the cross, the soldiers were wanting to hurry and be done. So they thought, we'll break his legs and be done with it. Because it makes him die instantly. Jesus was still suffering. So they thought, ah, break his legs, get it over with, we're done. But that wasn't to be, because he had to remain unbroken throughout the whole ordeal to complete the atonement. So they broke the other men, the other people on the cross, they broke their legs. There was uh, two others, one, one, they broke their legs. They came to Jesus, but they didn't break his legs. Instead, they thought... Oh, we'll just pierce his side. So they pierced his side. And that's how he died. But it's because God wouldn't let them break his legs. So he had to remain unbroken. He has taken my brokenness upon him. And through the blood of the Lamb, he has healed me and made me white in his blood and washed me in his blood. So it talks about 62 times in this book, the blood of the lamb, saying, put it on your heart. Let him be that blood on our hearts. That he will lift us up from the first fruits of resurrection, we too, can be the first fruits of resurrection. And that is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Any, any questions? Questions? Um, about Rosh Hashanah is a is a feast about the New Year when yes. New Year. Is that a, a feast or what is it? I didn't see Rosh Hashanah. I think. Still, it's a feast of trumpets. Oh, it's a feast Rosh Hashanah. Of the trumpet. is a Rosh Hashanah. Uh, beans. Head of the year. Okay, head of the year. Yes, Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. So when they start their new year, yeah. So, but that's a feast of trumpets for repentance. Okay. Too. Yeah, it's all in one. Anybody else? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Is that about uh, the? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Is that about the, the feast, the feast of in, in the Jewish? But I went to Jerusalem. And I saw in the world they are always moving when they read the Torah. And why they, you know, why they move the world? I don't know. That's a, a custom. It's not in the law. I can tell you. Oh, please. It's because when they stand still, it hurts their back. That's all. By moving, they can do it longer. I asked them. That's what they said. Oh, oh yes. Oh. He, he asked why in the wall, the western wall, they pray, they, they will be moving. Hans said it's to, so they can pray longer, so they don't get sore back. 
They could go longer. Uh, one more thing I forgot to add. The law commands that they take the lamb, each family gets their lamb, four days before Passover. So on day 10, so the first night they got it the first day, that day. But forever after that, to, to rehearse the commemoration, each family has to get the lamb four days before Passover. It lives in their home. One-year-old male lamb, baby lamb. And it, they feed it, they love it, they cuddle it, they pet it. And commanded to do that because they bond emotionally to the lamb. And then on 14, Nisan, Passover, then the father takes the lamb to the priest, and the priest, on behalf of the family, puts the sins of the family for the year on the lamb, and the lamb is then sacrificed. But the family is very sad, because for four days, they bonded with the lamb. But that is Jesus' teaching about children, people, that it's a sacrifice, it's sad to them to give up the lamb. He needed, he wanted them to feel the loss, right? You would, like you like a puppy or a cat, right? You feel that loss. And one more thing about a lamb. When you cut its throat, lambs don't resist their own death. They don't try to squirm away. Very often, they will spend their last breath licking the blood off the hands of the priest after he slits their throat. The last loving gesture is if to say, I understand. I forgive, and then lamb dies. It's a very sweet thing. Lamb is very meek, but it doesn't resist its own death. Just like Jesus didn't resist. So <clears throat> lambs are very, very important to this law. So it's important that in the land that he took them with, they were lambs everywhere. The lambs were there in the promised land so they could learn this. A anyone else? Yes? Could you explain more about the book of the what? The book of life, right? Oh, the book of life. Yes. Yeah, because I know that God has tried to us, but we talk about yeah. the book of life. Okay. So it's symbolic. They don't. They don't really have a book. It's a uh, okay. symbol. Uh, their belief is that the book of life is opened, and their life. Yes, their name has to be. It's, it's, it's not. Uh, it's not literal. But because yeah. on, only God knows if their hearts are good. So if their hearts are not good, they have ten days to get right. Any other questions? Ready? So, um, one question. Yes. Uh, the question was, um, when you see Moroni with the trumpet, that's to announce uh, the, the first day of, of all the, mm -hmm. the yes. Feast of the Trumpet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That so? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. So on, on our temple, symbolically, we put them up there, symbolically, announce the final harvest of the souls. Jesus is coming. Repent. He's coming again. The second coming. So that's why he's on our temples with that. And that yes. was on the 22nd of 22nd September. 22nd of September. 23, 1823, 1824, 25, 26, 27. Yes. Oh, he's just wondering about Moroni being up on our temples, up with the sword. A uh, sword. Um, trumpet to call the world to repentance. The world. It's the final call because uh, the feast is being gathered in and he's coming again. The bridegroom is coming. So it's symbolic for us to repent and come in because he's coming. And we get right with the Lord because he's coming. So that's the symbol. You had a question about where did you find that the lamb was put in a cross? Oh, and... Mm -hmm. And with the crown, and yes. So that is in the in the uh, like Mishnah in the commentary it, uh, that it just says that in the book it's roasted upright. But to do that, what the Jews learned to do was put the stick in because that's how it has to be. So they learned that part. The, the Leviticus is roasted upright on a stick. Leviticus. So that's how they that's how they could execute that command. They could do that. Command. Does that make sense? Leviticus. Yes? So the woman, from now on, once she's married, she covers her hair. Her hair is her crown. Only her husband can see her crown. 
so she covers her hair from now on. So she doesn't, she doesn't wear it's only the man. But the similar is her hair is covered. Kind of same, yeah. A woman who's married is covered. It's purity. A anybody else? Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Bonjour. <laughs>